few organisations depend on their vehicles the way the Halo Trust does. For over 30 years they've helped people from war-torn countries remove landmines and other unexploded devices. It's dangerous work. But their trusted vehicles are getting old. With some vehicles in Halo's fleet now 40 years old, the organisation is looking for its next generation of off-road workhorses. So they're intrigued by what the Grenadier could offer. Mark, Grenadier is announcing the engineering development relationship with the Halo Trust, but it's not actually a new relationship, is it? No, it's not. We've been working quite closely with Halo for the last two years or so as part of the development programme for the vehicle. Um, and just so proud today to, to announce it finally. Um, Halo, what they do around the world is phenomenal. They're the leading landmine clearance charity, working in 20 plus countries around the world to make these formerly war-torn areas safe for the communities that live in them. So um, association with, with Halo is fantastic for us, as well as bringing some very valuable benefits to the programme. So why are you announcing it now? Well, it seemed the right time because this is the testing and development phase. We talked about testing and development in plain sight. And I think the thing I'd really stress is that mileage accumulation is essential. Any automotive development program is going to put lots of miles on the vehicle. Of the 1.8 million kilometres we're doing, 300,000 of them will be off-road. But as well as the um, punishing tests that the engineers are putting the vehicles through, um, chucking the keys in the direction of a, a super user, if you like, like the Halo Trust, for whom durability, reliability and capability are not nice to have. They're essential, they're life or death in these environments. Um, that's a really important addition to the programme to see how the vehicle performs with a customer in real life. You've been with Halo a, a long time now. Just a couple of months under 23 years and, and, and all across the world. But the mission is always the same, isn't it? I mean, you are going to clear unexploded bombs essentially to, to try and save lives and, and whole communities can live more normally. Well, the, the armies leave, you know, they, they, they move on and then people try and go back to their homes. And often we see the biggest spike in casualties is as people come back to their homes immediately after a, a conflict. But army, but it's not just armies that are laying antipersonnel mines. There were so many mines out there in the 80s, in the, the sort of late 70s through the 90s until they were banned that they fell into the hands of large numbers of non-state actors, you know, terrorist groups, rebel groups, whatever, who, who laid them very indiscriminately. So a lot of time we're clearing mines that were laid to no, no recognisable military pattern and for no, frankly, no military utility. They're simply there to terrorise the population. We've had a number of conversations back at base between engineers and field people, but also we've sent people out to, particularly to Angola, to see, um, I think, what Halo regard as one of their toughest operating environments. Steve, it's good to see you back after your trip to Angola. Thank you. And at Halo's base now, which is, yes. very, which is a very different place <laughs> very to different. where you were in Angola. Oh, that's for sure, yeah. And Angola was uh, very, very different. And it's nice to be here. It's nice to be back with the Halo guys again. You are developing and building a tool that people will rely on to save lives. Totally. And it, yeah, it's a real life, real world um, vehicle that we're building. So yeah, actually it puts you under a little bit of pressure to make sure that you get it right because there are lives on the line and these things are used as ambulances too so they've got to be robust. Yeah, well, these, these guys are not playing at off-roading, are they? At all. There's an acceptance, I think, amongst anybody who uses four-wheel drives in, in proper off-road conditions. They will break. No matter, no matter what you build, they will break. But the issue is about how easy is it to service them. Will what you've learned and, and, and the help you're getting from Halo in terms of development translate into every Grenadier that is available to an end customer? Yes, it will. Um, not just the feeding into the module teams or the engineering teams, but out of the back of that, then we've got a serviceability team that are looking at every aspect of how we then build to how we then service. And can it be stripped down? Can we, can we fix it in the field? I mean, it sounds like a brilliant relationship, a great fit. What's the, what's the next step 
So the next stage for us is to uh, bring the guys over to uh, the offices in uh, Bublingham and sit down with the engineers and then use one of our prototypes um, for some shakedown areas in one of the live programs that Halo are running around the world. How dependent are you on 4x4s? No, absolutely. I mean, we couldn't operate without them. In order to be able to clear minefields, and this is in some of the, you know, the remotest, most inaccessible parts of the planet, we have to be able to get our deminers to those minefields. And when they're operating, we need to have an ambulance on standby that can drive from that minefield to the nearest hospital, which might be four or five hours away. If we don't, don't have that, we can't work. Give me a sense of the scale of the fleet then. So we have uh, about 1,500 vehicles, and that ranges from, from big trucks, armoured loaders and bulldozers, excavators, and also 4x4s. We've got 600 4x4s spread across 26 countries of the world. What difference would it make to the Halo Trust and your teams on the ground if Grenadier pulls this off and delivers exactly what you want? Well, then, then, then we have a reliable workhorse that we can use in remote and hazardous areas. And, you know, we're the, that's what we do. We work in hazardous remote areas. So if we've got a vehicle that can do it, then it's one less thing to worry about. So the term landmine feels like a bit of a catch-all. I mean, it, how big then? Well, I've got one. That is a YM-1. It's an Iranian plastic-cased anti-personnel blast mine. Um, that's all it takes to detonate it. There's no delay, there's no business of treading on it, and it only goes off when you take your foot off. That's, a, that's an illusion uh, that's in the movies. No, that, and there's about 40 grams of explosives in there, which is enough to take your foot off. Wow. So, I mean, in the broadest sense then, who, who are the victims? Who are the people that you're helping? Well, they're often the, the poorest people. And so I've seen communities that are literally living in the middle of minefields and they cannot cultivate their soil, they cannot cultivate their ground because it's entirely full of mines. And then we'll go in, we'll hire people from the village, we will give them the training, the equipment and set them to work clearing mines from their own fields. And then when they get paid at the end of the month, they can spend their salary on seed so they can start growing food for their families. And then you go back, you literally, you can go back a few years later and they've got a school. There's a road that goes into the village. It, it, the village itself exists, it appears on a sensor. Wow, I mean, that's, and that's a very powerful circle where it's everybody is benefiting. Yeah, and, and, and often what you'll find is nobody remembers that it was a minefield. And I think often that when we have achieved success, it's when nobody remembers that we were ever there. If we can um, get it right for Halo, that should give everybody confidence that this vehicle has been engineered properly to do the job we promised it will do.